I am Martin Pushfai and I'm faculty at the Department of Network and Data Science at CEU. And I'm here to introduce you to our new BA program, the Quantitative Social Sciences. And I will also do an example lecture uh, where I try to highlight the interdisciplinary nature of the program and show you uh, some stuff that you or that what kind of things that you will learn at this program. Okay, so let's start with the first question. What is quantitative social sciences and why should you be interested in it? So social science is, now, is a well-established uh, science. It's been around forever. But when it comes to quantitative stuff, it mostly focused on data coming from small-scale experiments or surveys. Uh, and, uh, right, okay, so, uh, so focus on small-scale experiments and surveys. Well, physics and computer science are also very well established uh, sciences. And physics has been around forever. Also, computer science is a newer thing, uh, but it's also very well established. And these sciences use advanced mathematics, but they focus on much simpler things than society, right? So the behavior of an electron is much, much simpler than the behavior of a human being. Okay, but what happened in the last couple of decades is now that we started to produce almost unlimited social data. Uh, with the uh, digital revolution, we are constantly connected to, to, the, uh, to the internet. Everything what, that we do is being recorded and we produce mass amounts of data. Uh, and to analyze this data, to understand this data, you need advanced mathematical tools that are closer to the tools of physics and computer science than to the tools of classical social sciences. Okay, so then what happened is that uh, we see a convergence. So social scientists became interested in the tools of physics and computer science because they are what they want to be able to analyze this rich data set. While physicists and computer scientists realize that they can do measurements on the social data, they can develop new algorithms to understand it, and uh, they became interested in this new uh, focus area. So uh, to be able to work on this data effectively, what you need is you need a background in both uh, rigorous social theory and both in rigorous mathematics. And this is exactly what Quantitative Social Sciences BA program provides. Okay, at the end of the uh, uh, lecture, I will also give you a overview, a more detailed overview of the program, but now I'll switch to the uh, sample lecture that I'm going to do. So the topic that I chose is wisdom of the crowds, because I think that this topic highlights the interdisciplinary nature of what we do. And it's also kind of an interesting uh, example of the things that you can study in, in our program. So the basic question that we're going to investigate is how smart a group of people can be if we put them together. Okay, how good their collective decisions will be. Okay, so if you go back like 100, 200 years and see what people thought about this, you will find opinions such as Nietzsche said that the madness is the exception in the individuals, but the rule in groups. And Thoreau, uh, the American writer, wrote that the mass never comes up to the standard of its best member, but on the contrary, degrades itself to a level with the lowest. Okay, so these opinions are kind of negative. They don't really believe in group intelligence. Uh, I even thought, uh, found a saying from dogmushers. Uh, dogmushers are people who drive dog sleds, right? Saying that your sled is as fast as your slowest dog. So all, the qu question is, are these opinions, these negative opinions correct? Uh, what, is the, what is the level of your group's intelligence? Is it at the level of the dumbest? Maybe it's at the level of the smartest? Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, I want, let's start with this guy named Sir Francis Galton. So he was a scientist at the turn of the 19th, uh, 20th century. He was a, uh, no, wait, uh, yeah, uh, he was a cousin of, of uh, Darwin and he was a polymath. He, studied many different things. He actually was one of the founders of statistics and meteorology, but he also wrote a paper on how to cut up a cake uh, in order that when you store the cake, it doesn't dry out. And this paper actually was published in Nature itself. So in addition to these topics, he was also interested in measuring mental and physical uh, abilities of people. And he was interested in the question whether these are inherited or they come with your upbringing. So he was interested in this nature versus nurture question. So what he did, uh, for example, is that he set up, he went to an expo and he set up a laboratory where the visitors at the expo could come and they could test themselves. They could test their mental abilities, they could test their eyesight, their strength, and so on. 
And he recorded this data and analyzed it. And the conclusion that he came to is that the stupidity and wrongheadedness of many men and women being so great as to be scarcely credible. So he, he came away with a very bad opinion about people. And he later said that based on this, he said that society should be led by a select few and it shouldn't be uh, uh, like a, a public collective decision on how society should progress. Okay, but later he did another experiment. So he visited a, uh, another expo. This one is uh, called West of England Fat Stock and Poultry Exhibition. So this is an expo on, on animals. And there was a contest that, that he saw there that uh, they brought out an ox and people could guess the weight of the ox. So they would have to write it down on a piece of paper and they would throw it in a ballot box. And in the end, the person who was the closest to the actual weight of the ox uh, got a prize. So altogether, there were approximately 800 guesses. And uh, Galton asked the organizers if he could have the guesses afterwards. And then he did some statistics with it. So what he found, for example, is that the average guess was 1,197 pounds. And it turned out that this was just one pound off the actual value. And what's even more interesting is that the average guess was better than any individual guess in the contest, meaning that the collective judgment of the group was better than the best member in the group. And after this observation, uh, his opinion about people mellowed a little bit, and he said that the result seems more creditable uh, to the trustworth trustworthiness of democratic judgment than, my, uh, than one might have been expected. Okay, uh, I'll give you a second example. So this example comes from pathology. So pathology is a uh, medical profession, right? Pathologists have to look at samples that are collected and prepared, and then they have to make a diagnosis based on the sample. For example, they, ha they have to decide whether a tumor is benign or malignant. So this is a very hard job. Uh, pathologists go through very rigorous training and they study for many years. And sometimes they say that this is more of an art than an actual science. So this is a difficult problem. So what some uh, researchers at the University of California Davis did is that they took a small group of non-experts and they trained them for a couple of weeks to be able to differentiate between benign samples and malignant samples. And afterwards, they tested them. Their individual accuracy was well below experts, but actually if you pooled together their guesses and they combined them, then their accuracy rose to 99%, which was on par with the, the uh, performance of experts on this given uh, samples. But there's a twist in the story, right? The twist is, that uh, these non-experts were actually just pigeons. So they took pigeons and they trained them to recognize uh, different images. And combining their knowledge was as good as a human pathologist. Of course, this is a very specific test that they trained the pigeons for. Uh, so you're in the near future, not, you're not going to go to the doctor's office and meet with pigeons, uh, but still it's kind of an interesting story. So I gave you two examples that are kind of far away from real world applications, like guessing the weight of an ox, or training pigeons. But my third example is going to be something uh, that we use every day, and it actually uh, works very well. So this is about Google and how Google uh, ranks pages. Uh, so the story of Google starts back in the, uh, in the early days of the internet in 1998. So at this time, the internet was a relatively small place and there were many uh, search engines that were competing with each other for the users. And Google joined the marketplace. And even though the marketplace was very crowded, Google was able to dominate and outgrow each of these. Now, how did they do this? So these uh, original uh, old search engines uh, actually relied a lot on expert knowledge. So for example, Yahoo hired uh, editors that would read websites and they would index them individually by hand and they would provide the search results based on this indexing. Of course, the internet has grown uh, to, uh, to be much, much bigger and this would be impossible right now, right? So, but what Google did is actually, they said that, okay, let's take a website. For example, here's a website that pronounces that I like cats. And this website uh, has a link on it that points at a website about cats. Okay, so Google said that we can interpret this link as an endorsement. So the creator of this website, me, 
says with this link that this is a good website about cats, right? So this is an endorsement. Now you can think about uh, the internet as a network of websites, each pointing at each other, each endorsing each other. So this is a network of endorsements where these circles, these nodes are websites and the arrows in between them are endorsements. Okay, so how can you pick the most important website based on this network? So what you can do, for example, is you can count the number of endorsements that it receives and say that this is the most important website. And uh, so this already doesn't involve human editors, but it's based on implicit social data that is uh, introduced there by the website creators. Okay, but what Google actually did is that they went one step further and they said that not in all endorsements are equal to each other. So some websites are unimportant uh, and other websites are very important. So endorsements coming from important websites should matter more. And they came up with an algorithm that they named PageRank, which exactly does this. So it weights the endorsements based on the importance of the, of the website. And if you evaluate these website importances based on this algorithm, what you find is actually this guy, this website over here is the most important one, uh, although it has less the number of endorsements than this one over here. And this worked very well because this page rank happens to be very good at picking the top few important websites. It's not so good at ordering the websites and importance in the middle or in the bottom of the ranking, but actually what matters for the user is the top few. So whenever you search for something, you only look at the top few uh, hits. And right, so the internet is of course not such a small network as this over here. It's a much larger place. So this image over here is a visualization of uh, the web pages of a university, actually just a single university over here. There are more than 300,000 web pages on, under the domain of this university. And Google's algorithm is able to pick out the most important websites from these huge networks over here. Okay, so what put Google over the top is that they found a smart way to aggregate implicit endorsements of website creators. So they aggregated social data in a way that it highlights a good collective judgment. Okay, so these were three examples of how collective judgments uh, might be used. Uh, but of course, in society, there are many other cases where we rely on collective judgment. So the most obvious ones could be like elections, or polls, or juries, where we explicitly ask a group of people to give their opinion about a given question. But as I showed you, search engines, social media feeds, movie recommendations, all depend on social data that is being aggregated by these websites that provide these services. And there are also markets which also provide uh, social judgment. So uh, the smart, uh, stock market tries to uh, give a value to a company or commodity based on uh, its future performance. So it tries to predict the future performance of these companies. So it's an aggregate of the action of the individual tra uh, traders. Okay, so the examples that I give you all worked, but collective judgment might actually also fail. And when it fails, it might actually fail very badly. So I'll give you one example of this as well. So this is related to uh, the marketplace. And for this example, we again have to go back uh, to the heyday of the internet to the early 90s. So this time, uh, the World Wide Web was a new thing. Everybody was super enthusiastic about it, and everybody thought that this will change the world, but eventually it actually did. But what happened is that we have, there was a lot of enthusiasm for companies that had a .com in their name. So you had websites like pets.com, boo.com, uh, but also amazon.com uh, was founded at this time. And uh, everybody started investing into these companies and the stock prices of these companies crawled up. And even if you weren't personally sure that uh, these companies will actually do what they promise or they will be successful, you, you maybe you didn't want to miss out and you would jump the bandwagon. Okay, but then what happened is 2000 came and people started realizing that these companies don't have enough paying customers to actually support their business model. And people started selling off the stocks and this led to the so-called dot-com bubble where the price of these stocks collapsed and there was a huge loss in the marketplace. Okay, so this is a, a case where collective decision went wrong. So there were a few cases where 
where it worked, and there I give you an example where it didn't work. So what's the difference between these cases? When does collective decision work, and uh, when does it fail? So I would like to group the requirements for collective decisions to work into like three categories. First, we have to look at the question. So the question, if the question is simple and has a clear answer, then it will be much easier for it to answer to be answered by the group. For example, the weight of an ox is just a number. Uh, the uh, millionth or or benign sample is a yes or no question. The ranking websites is a little bit harder, but still uh, our collective decision kind of works in that case. While predicting the value of stock markets or, or stocks is a much harder question, but most of the cases it still works, but some cases actually we get it way off. Then the composition of the group also is very important. So you need individuals in the group who have at least some inkling about the answer, they, so they cannot be completely ignorant. So even in the case of, of pigeons, of course, they don't know much about human anatomy, but actually they were chosen for a purpose. That purpose being is that they have very good vision and they're actually good at recognizing images. So that's why they chose to use pigeons as test animals in this experiment. But usually what you need in the group is you need a diversity of information. You need people with slightly di with different knowledge about the problem or people coming from different backgrounds. All right, and finally, it's also very important how the answers are aggregated. And especially important that the participants have to be sufficiently independent from each other. And this is the last question that I want to talk a little bit more about to highlight how this can affect the outcome. Okay, so first thing about this is social conformity. So I'll, I'll show you an experiment that was done in the 50s by this guy named Salman Ash, uh, who was a uh, social psychologist. And he did this famous experiment where uh, he showed a very easy question to participants. For example, what he showed is that he showed these three lines and he asked them to pick out the line that has equal length to the line over here on the left. Of course, this is the simple question, right? Uh, sorry, it's, it is line number two. So what he did is he showed this to a participant and he measured the number of times that he got the answer correct. And what he found is that almost always they got the answer correctly. So not, no surprise there. But the twist in his experiment was then he placed this individual into a group. But in this group, the others weren't participants, they were actually actors. And the actors insisted that uh, the correct answer is one of the obviously wrong ones. For example, answer number one over here. Now, he measured again uh, the correctness of the answers given by the participant. And what he found is actually almost 40% of the people chose the obviously wrong answer. Even when it was obviously wrong, they just tried to conform to their group. They didn't want to stand out. Okay, another thing is that the larger the group was initially, the more likely you were uh, to pick the wrong answer, but it kind of leveled out. So after a while, the size of the group didn't matter. Peer pressure was already at its maximum. Okay, so how can this affect our collective judgment? Right? Uh, conformity is not just a local effect. It's not just that you uh, change your personal opinion based on your friends or your peers, but this can actually cascade and make and change our, our, our collective decisions as well. Okay, uh, to show you how this works, I will uh, show you a very simple mathematical model that tries to capture how conformity or how opinions can spread on a social network. Uh, this model actually was done by a guy uh, who was originally a physicist, but then became a professor in social sciences. So it kind of highlights uh, the interdisciplinary nature of this problem. Okay, so in this model, he said that let's model society or a group of people with a network. In the network, uh, each person is connected to uh, its friends or people that he talked to. So, so these are people that could influence his opinion about something. And then each person has to decide uh, a yes or no question. For example, uh, do you want to buy stocks or not? And he also built in conformity into this model, saying that if a certain fraction of my neighbors uh, choose to buy stocks, then I will also change my mind and buy stocks, even if my original decision was not to buy stocks. Okay, so for example, uh, let's look at this guy here in the middle. 
this person over here. Let's say he originally says that he doesn't want to buy stocks, but uh, three of his neighbors buy stocks. And if this conformity level is set to 50%, then he will change his opinion. And even though his original decision was different, he will go on and buy stocks. Okay, so how does this play out uh, in the network? So let's start by adding, uh, picking randomly a couple of individuals that will buy stocks. Let's say these two people over here. Some of his neighbors will now decide based on this connection with them that they will also buy stocks. But then if conformity is low, the process will stop here and there will be only local effects. Now, if we again do the same thing, but with high conformity, meaning that, meaning that people will adopt much more easily, what happens is that again, some of their neighbors, but now more neighbors will adopt this behavior, but the process doesn't stop here, but it will snowball on and neighbors of these neighbors will also adopt and so on all the way until everybody has adopted. Right? You can see that the original collective decision was that only a few people bought the spot, uh, the, the, spot, the stocks, uh, but due to conformity, the, uh, um, the collective decision changed from the original to this different one. So the thing is that the individuals making the collective decision here are not independent from each other, but they copy each other's behavior. And then uh, the result might be very, very different from what they would have decided if they are independent from each other. Okay, because this is a very simple mathematical model, what I want to show you is that you can use the mindset of a physicist or somebody coming from, from a more rigorous mathematical background and try to describe uh, using equations the behavior of this model to systematically understand the mechanisms that drive conformity. Right, so I'll, these are the equations that you solve, then you can solve the behavior of the model. Uh, I'm just showing this to you uh, so that you can see that this is possible. Of course, you don't have enough information to understand these equations. But the result is this, that you, what you see over here. So on the vertical, on the, on the horizontal axis, what you have is the strength of conformity. So this is a parameter of the model. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have low conformity. On the left-hand side, you have high conformity. Now, if you have high conformity, then you are more likely to have large cascades, right? So the more easily we copy each other, the more likely that uh, the opinions will snowball and cascade away. On the vertical axis, you have the average number of friends you have in the network. So another parameter of the model is actually the network structure uh, that we use to model the group of people. So on the top, you have people, uh, the case when we have many friends, and on the bottom, you have the case when we only have a few friends. And it turns out if you have many friends, your friends will have diverse opinions, and it's unlikely that the original small seed of adoption can be amplified because you look at too many people simultaneously and you just see the overall average, and there are no local seeds that can grow. All right, so the bottom line here is that I showed you a very, very simple mathematical model that identifies mechanisms on how uh, kind of shows you how small local conformity can cascade into something global. Uh, this global cascades is kind of a critical mass runaway effect. So if the uh, early adopters that people in the beginning reach a critical mass, then this goes, uh, the process, to, you, you start the positive feedback. So the more people adopted, the more likely new people would adopt. And this goes back and forth until everybody adopts. Okay, so there are two things uh, that this global cascade depends on. One is conformity level and the other is social network. Uh, I talked mostly about social network so far, but what determines the conformity parameter of the model? What determines the level of conformity in your, your group of people? So actually it, depend, it depends on a number of things. So it depends also on, on how good your information is that is trying to spread. So actually if the information is good, it spreads much more easily because it provides a good solution to an existing problem. And it turns out that most of the cascades are actually good. Uh, they did a, a classroom experiment, an economist did a classroom experiment where they showed that good cascades uh, or good solutions could cascade, I don't know, 80% of the time versus uh, bad cascades or, the bad dis or, or this cascading process produced the right solution 80% of the time versus 20% of the time when it was wrong. The other thing, uh, that is important on who do you listen to. If you talk to people that have similar opinion to yours or they are similar people to you, 
then you are more likely to adopt their, their opinions. Okay, uh, so as I said, there are some good cascades when we pick the right solution uh, for our problem, but there are also bad cascades. So if you end up talking to people with similar opinions uh, as yourself, that might lead to polarization or to echo chambers, and that might lead to very bad uh, collective decisions. Okay, so uh, why is this important? Because the information that we are presented online depends on algorithms. So we use Facebook, we use Twitter, we use Netflix to decide what movies we watch, to what news we, uh, we listen to, on what things we buy. And uh, the information that we receive really depends on how these algorithms work. So these algorithms has an outsized effect on our life and uh, we need to understand them in order to be able to understand uh, social data. Okay, and this leads, uh, leads to my greater conclusion. So that we produce a bunch of social data. And this is being fed into technology, is being fed into these websites and services. And then it, uh, it will feed it back to us. It will make some sort of collective judgment on our behalf and it feeds it back to us. And in order to understand these systems, we need both rigorous social, to understand rigorously social theory, but we also need the technical, the mathematical background in order to understand the technology, in order to understand this massive amounts of data. And uh, so this is exactly what our program aims to provide uh, to the students who, who decide to join. Okay, so if you're interested in uh, what I talked about a little bit more, I can recommend two books. So this first one is called The Wisdom of the Crowd. So many of the examples that I talked about are in more detail in this book. The second one is written by Hannah Fry, who is a mathematician. And she wrote this very, very interesting book uh, that is about how algorithms uh, work and how they can make our life better, but also what are the cases when uh, uh, they might uh, be wrong or might lead to difficulties. So it looks at both sides uh, of this world. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, at this point, this is the end of my sample lecture. So if anyone has any questions, maybe this is a good time that you can ask me, but we can also get back to questions at the end because I still would like to talk a little bit about the, the program itself. So if the, then I'll just continue and then, then maybe someone can ask a question at the end. All right, so why, why should you be interested in participating in quantitative social sciences? So what I try to highlight uh, today is that social data is important because it affects our life, because it's an interesting and rich data set. And uh, understanding it is a highly interdisciplinary endeavor. So the examples that I covered involve social scientists, social psychologists, computer scientists, physicists, and so on. So uh, people coming from very diverse backgrounds are working on these problems. So all of these people, the, the one common denominator with these people is that they studied one of these traditional disciplines and they had to learn a bunch of new skills in order to work with this type of data and work on these type of problems. But not only that they had to learn, but they also had to unlearn skills. So originally, actually, I'm a physicist. And when I became a physicist, I went to university, I got indoctrinated by the main ideas of physics. So when you become a physicist, you think like a physicist about every problem. So I actually lived a couple of years in California uh, where I was working with physicists. And uh, they are very, very similar to me because they went through the same process of becoming a physicist. They laugh at the same jokes. They approach each problem uh, with uh, the same mindset as I do. Okay, and this is actually very useful to, to attack these problems because physics has useful tools uh, to understand uh, social data. But there are other things that you have to unlearn. Some of the things of traditional physics just doesn't work for these new types of problems and you have to forget about them. You have to adapt to this new situation. So ideally, people who work with these types of, pro types of problems would have training in both rigorous social science and both rigorous mathematics from the get-go and they don't have to adapt themselves later on in their life. Okay, so how does the program look like? Uh, the program has basically two parallel parts, or not necessarily, maybe two parts, right? One's focused more on mathematics and computational tools, and the other focused more on social sciences 
and related sciences, such as sociology, economics, and political science, and uh, social aspects of environmental, environmental science. So in time, in the first year is with this mand mandatory courses that are introductory courses into these fields. And then you get to choose two majors that you can work on. And the later years, among many other things, you do two different projects on your bachelor thesis and a capstone project where you get to work together with faculty members, either from my department, the Department of Network and Data Science, or other departments that participate in the program, such as sociology or economics. Okay, so here's a bunch of lists. Here's a list of courses that you can take. Maybe this is not too interesting, but a question that might, might interest you is what kind of jobs can you get if you finish this uh, program? So I, I could pull up some statistics here saying that there's a lot of data science jobs out there. If you go on a website, you can see that there are tons of them. And I would venture and say that most of these jobs actually involve social data and not other types of data. But I don't want to do that. I, could, I would also really love to give you examples of students who have finished in this program uh, and tell you on what kind of jobs they, they scored afterwards. But this program is very new and we only have one year of students enrolled right now, so I can't do this. So instead, what I did is I looked at uh, some of my friends who studied in one of the traditional disciplines and then trained themselves to be able to work with these interdisciplinary problems. And uh, I'll tell you on what kind of jobs that they work in. Now, I didn't ask for permission to use their names, so I will just call them friend one, two, and three. But actually, the first friend is, is Eliza Mode. She's a faculty member currently at our department, and uh, you can study statistics from her if you join the program. So she originally was a physicist, but during her PhD, uh, she learned about networks, machine learning, and social aspects of these. And she ended up working for UNICEF, working on problems related to food security. And actually, one of, the pro one of the projects that she worked on, you can check it out through this link, if you, uh, through this QR code over here, is this real-time hunger map. What, uh, what this does is that it processes data as it uh, as is being produced automatically, this data is like, uh, involves meteorological data, it involves uh, data coming from social feeds and so on, and it processes this and uh, produces a real-time map highlighting areas in the world that uh, have food scarcity, scarcity going on right now. Okay, a second friend of mine, uh, uh, she's a social scientist by training, but then she learned machine learning and she learned about natural language processing. And she and another social scientist started a, uh, a company uh, that does market research using these tools, using these computational tools. So they process social data and they provide information uh, for other companies that hire them. Uh, it's a, a very successful company. They have clients that are huge international companies, but also more local things as well. And my third friend, she studied originally communications, which is also a branch of, of social sciences. And then during her PhD, she learned about programming and machine learning again. And she studied the success of groups in online gaming. But then when she finished, she actually got hired by Facebook. And now she's part of their computational social science uh, team. So what I think is that these three examples kind of run the whole gamut of possible jobs that you can take uh, with this degree in the end. You can work for NGOs, you can work for small companies, or you can work for the biggest companies in the world as well. And I think all of these jobs are very important. Obviously, food security is a very important question, but also working for Facebook is very important because there's a huge impact of what you do because Facebook is such an integral part of our lives and society that uh, uh, to understand or like to influence on how it works would have a huge influence in how the world works. All right, uh, so this was my presentation. I, I hope you enjoyed it. You can find more information about the program through this link over here. And uh, let me know if you have any questions about the program or about the lecture or anything. Thank you, Marton. Um, I encourage you to, um, I mean, the, the students or our guests um, watching us, you don't have to turn on your cameras, but we would appreciate if you turn on your microphones maybe and ask um, any questions regarding the program, regarding quantitative social science, regarding CEU, regarding applications, everything goes.
so I want to ask, uh, what kind of lessons do you need to take during uh, the course? You mean, it, if you enroll in this course at the university, what kind of classes you will have or what kind yeah, of Yeah, classes? yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, Marty, can you pull up the... Uh, yeah, I can, I can do that, but I, I can start answering also. Okay. Uh, so, uh, let me see. Just... So first here is about the introductory courses to these main topics. So actually, the students parallel start uh, working on... Sorry, what's this? So I guess this, this is the slide over here. So you, you parallel start learning mathematics. So you have linear algebra class, you have introductions to statistics and things like this. So these are on the level of, for example, what a physics or computer science students would learn uh, at the beginning of their degree or the beginning of their program. Uh, you also learn programming. This is in uh, uh, Python. And, uh, you learn, but you also start learning about social theory. So you have introduction to uh, uh, social sciences, you have introduction to political economy and so on. And these are taught by experts in this field. So these are not taught by uh, uh, physicists like us who happen to study uh, or happen to like uh, navigate themselves into a field where we actually learn, use this data, but you actually learn it from, from, from economists or environmental scientists or political scientists. So you have all of these and in CU you have terms, which is, uh, means that you have, the year is divided up into four terms, but in the summer term, you don't have classes. So you take each, uh, each course for 12 weeks. So you get a, huge, a very diverse education that first year. And then you can specialize later on into the direction that you're more interested in. I would also like to add, and this was on one of your slides, that so these are, okay, in every CEU BA program, the first year, everybody studies the same thing, everything is mandatory. This is what we believe is necessary for you to, um, to begin the program. So you need to get some foundations in your program. And then from the second year on, um, you get to um, choose um, some of the things that you want to focus on more, you get to drop some other things, um, and you can start slowly um, taking electives. Electives are courses that have maybe something to do with the, your major specialization, or they might have nothing to do with it. For example, um, you could take classes from the other two BA programs um, that are offered as electives. For example, you can take a, a course on philosophy if that's what you're, you always wanted to do, or that if you are interested in that, you could take a course in um, um, visual design because that's also offered um, and so on and so forth. And you will also have students from the other two programs join your program because they want to take, uh, um, you know, they want to learn how to program in Python. Um, so that's, that's how it works. And the more you progress in the, in the degree, the more you specialize and focus in on one, specific, one or two specific areas. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Answer? Yeah, okay. Any any other question? Um, I have one as well. Sure. And it's that what are the entry requirements for this course? Sure. Um, Marty, if you stop the sharing, then I will share yes. my screen. I also have a slide. Um, one sec. So we are an American university, and because of that, we have this holistic approach to evaluating the applications, which also means that we take more into account than just the um, just the, your grades or your test scores, or your academics. Um, so therefore, we ask you to put together a portfolio of, of things for your application. Um, and this is what it looks like. Uh, so if I hope you can see um, see the slide. So we would like to see your high school records. If you are applying, well, most of the students apply in their last year of high school, so in 12th grade. And at that point, they don't have their high school diploma yet. They don't have their final transcript, but we would like to see whatever is they have available at that point. 
So final grades from ninth grade, 10th grade, and 11th grade, and whatever is available from 12th grade. If nothing, we'll take that too. Um, if you have taken or are planning to take any kind of academic, extra academic testing, like let's say some students are applying to US universities um, in, in the US and they have to take the SAT or the ACT, or for some reason, maybe they attended schools where advanced placement tests were um, an option. If you have those and you are proud of the results, please show them to us. If you don't have them, do not take them just for us. Um, for QSS, however, we would like to see, like because of the nature of the program, it's really important that you have at least, a, you know, a, like a, a solid, you have solid skills in mathematics um, so that you will be able to follow the, the courses and, and, and the, um, build the skills that you need. Um, so therefore we will take a much closer look to your math, um, not only math, but your quantitative skills. So math, physics, computer science, anything, we will be looking at proof um, of, you know, solid quant quantitative skills um, in your high school records. If there is no proof there, or we're not sure, or you don't have, your grades are not so good, um, for, for, or if for any other reason we have any doubts, then we might ask you to um, take an extra math test. Um, but, you know, if the proof is there, then we will accept that. Mm, we need some kind of proof of English language proficiency. Um, so if you do not attend a school where language, English is the, the official teach, uh, um, language of teaching, then we require some kind of other test result, which can be TOEFL, IELTS, Cambridge. We even have, accept Duolingo, uh, which is really easy to take and it's probably the, the cheapest option. Um, we would like to see your CV where you can include all the activities that you do or extracurricular, um, you know, causes that you care about or um, things that you do in your free time out of pure pleasure or interest. Um, there will be two essays or yeah, written pieces that we require. One is an application essay, which is more academic in nature and you will find the instructions for that on the website. And the other one is easy motivation letter that should explain why you are um, applying to CU and why to this program in particular. We find that QSS applicants have a really easy time explaining why, why they are interested in the program. We found last year that everybody who applied, uh, well, or the majority of the students who applied were looking specifically for something like this. We also think that what we offer is a new opportunity for students um, who, are, who have strong skills in math and physics maybe, or, or other uh, quantitative um, fields. But instead of the traditional path of going and becoming a, a computer scientist or um, programmer, um, they would like to to do something with these skills that can be applied in other areas because they also, these students care about the world and the world around them and the, the, the many, many um, issues and problems that we face these days. Um, and then um, lastly, uh, recommendation letter, you know, that's pretty standard for, for many universities. We only require one and then Based on all of these, we select the ones that look like a good fit for the program. And those students, so only the finalists, are um, invited to, to do an interview with um, a few professors. So there's an admissions interview. That's the last step. And after that, we'll be able to decide um, what uh, who to offer uh, a place. Um, in terms of... Um, in terms of uh, timeline, this is important. Our application, in case anybody here is um, in their last year of high school, and a senior, um, we have um, our most important application deadline coming up in less than two weeks um, on February 1st. 
um, I say I said mo most important deadline because I mean students from Hungary and from the EU and EEA can also apply later, so until April fifteenth, but. All the financial aid or, or scholarship opportunities that we have will be given to students who apply by the first deadline. We don't we have limited uh, means, so we will have we, we want to honor the students who, who apply early. Um, so I hope that I answered your question. Yeah, thank you. OK, great. Um, we are running close to an hour. Is there anything else that you would like us to talk about? <laughs> Very big silence. Okay, we're not gonna torture you any longer. Um, I just have one last question. Can you uh, put up your hand you know, virtually if you are in 12th grade? So this is your final year and you might be maybe applying. No. Okay. So everybody's um, younger than that. Great. So thank you for coming. Um, we hope that um, uh, this was interesting. Um, and um, yeah, if, if you have questions later or you would like to find out more, um, I really hope that you know where to find us. Um, if not, it's undergraduate.cu.edu. That's the website. And from there, you will find our contact details. So thank you for your attention and um, have a great evening. Yeah, thanks for coming. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.